Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I'm here with talkie fanatic Michael Kessler. I love talkies. And um, well, we have some talkies mm-hmm. on, uh, on the showgram today. We're going to be doing two films that uh, are kind of a reaction to both World War II and, of course, Nazis in right. the, the cinema of the time. Well, comedic cinema. The comedic cinema of the time. Yeah, the comedic cinematic reaction to, uh, to that era and to that war. What are the two movies we're talking about? We're going to do the Marx Brothers film, A Night in Casablanca, and Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. So this is kind of an era we've never looked at, although it's a subject matter we've looked at, <laughs> I believe, 100,000 times. I apologize for that. No, it's absolutely fine. You know, we had, I mean, year one was big on that because we had a bunch of stuff. We had Schindler's List, infamously with Tank Girl. Uh, we had the infamous Downfall, and uh, a whole lot of stuff in yeah. between. I mean, even things like App Pupil. That Hard Rock just, Zombies. Yeah, right. There's Nazis just appearing all over this show. So that's been in stuff a little more recently, too. But we haven't covered it in as full subject matter as we did back in the first year. What's more interesting to me, um, now that we've covered all that stuff and why we probably haven't brought it up since then, is I don't know a lot about cinema of that time with the exception of, I guess, the Fritz Lang kind of stuff, mm-hmm. of monster movies, and later film noir. And that's kind of a couple different decades there. And none of that really addresses the war at all. And now we're looking at comedy addressing the war, which brings up that wonderful question, how soon is too soon? How soon is too soon? Apparently before before it happens. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Too soon doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. So we're going to learn all sorts of brilliant, brilliant things by looking at these movies. So anybody who's not familiar with anything that's ever gone on on the planet, uh, we're going to spoil these films. We're going to tell you who won the war. We're going to tell you who was involved in the war. We're going to tell you who flew planes into whose boats. So we're going to spoil both of them. Both the wars? Sure. Yeah, we'll spoil the wars. We'll spoil the films. And the the films as well. The Marx Brothers movie, uh, A Night in Casablanca, is going to be a little bit more Marx Brothers centric. Uh Uh-huh. And the Chaplin film will be a little bit more Hitler centric, despite the fact Hitler himself Never is not appears uh, in the film. yeah is not portrayed in the film at all. Can I also give people just a really quick cheat sheet? Don't be embarrassed if you don't know this. And we're Americans. Uh-huh. I don't expect the rest of the world that listens to this podcast to know this. But hey, so World War II starts in thirty nine. America's involvement in forty one ends in forty five. Right. Night in Casablanca was 46, maybe 45. I think right. 46 is right. So we're looking at about the end of the war. But Great Dictator is 1940. Yeah, so we're looking at before the United States involvement. Now, the two events that correlate with that are um, Hiroshima, a 1945 dropping of the bomb, mm-hmm. and then in 1941, Pearl Harbor, which historians might say provoked the United States to go into war. Historians might also say that Charlie Chaplin's speech at the end of the movie provoked that, but we we can look into that when we actually talk about the film. Why don't we start with A Night in Casablanca first? Hey, that's a good idea. So I have this feeling about the Marx Brothers, and let me share this with you, and you can tell me if you think this is accurate. Uh, It kind of feels like the Marx Brothers, their their routine, especially in their later stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know a ton about the Marx Brothers. I haven't seen a lot of it. Yeah. But what I have seen all follows a very similar pattern. In that they're a sort of um, they're a sort of variety hour. Yeah, they have these sight gags, they have one liners, and they have musical performances. Yep, and uh, they have this this sort of mixed bag of talent between mm-hmm. the three of them, or maybe four of them. If yeah, it's depending on when you're watching the enough. movie, right? If it's the Duck Soup era, I guess we have four of them. But uh, that was the last one with four Marx Brothers, and after that, it was right. the three. And so I wasn't quite as aware of their musical talents. Uh, before I actually saw A Night in Casablanca. And that was pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, it's really cool. But maybe we should kind of give a rundown of the three of them. Sure. So how would you describe Harpo? Let's go there first. Harpo, uh, he's the, he's always, he always seems to be the poorest one. He looks like a homeless man. Sure. 100% of the time. Well, when you start Night in Casablanca, you start thinking, what is this guy? He mm-hmm. holds up buildings for a living. Yeah, he, he must be the poor <laughs> right. one. Holds up buildings, brushes shoes, and never, ever speaks. Right. 
Everything he does is all sight gags. It's all pantomiming. There's some charades that they do literally in just about every film. Yeah. I've seen, I think, six or seven Marx Brothers movies, and I think maybe one doesn't have that charades gag sure, between sure. Harpo and Chico. Yeah. That gets real annoying real fun, <laughs> with all the whistling. Well, it's exhausting. Yeah. And, you know, the Groucho stuff's a little exhausting for me, too. As I watch these films, um, it's weird. Chico always serves the kind of the point of... You know, I get a break when I'm with Chico. Uh-huh. He's the straight man. The almost. other two, he's the straightest man, <laughs> right? The other two wear me down. I don't yeah. mean that in a bad way. I just mean I'm literally exhausted. I'm I'm panting. I have no breath by the time they get done with a routine. Uh-huh. I'm you know desperately trying to get through figuring out what they're saying. Yeah. Or when we're going through stuff like charades. If you realize it and the other character doesn't, and then you're shouting at the TV, it's like watching a, a frustrating game show mm-hmm. at that point. So Harpo's a bit more of a mime. He yeah. falls into a bit more of a, uh, I guess it's psych gag stuff, and it's um, it's kind of a clown routine mm-hmm. to it. It has the most, you know, circus aspect. Sure. And that's what I really like about the characters that Harpo does. Uh, you know, it's weird as we were watching this, I started thinking. You know, a couple of years ago, we did Penn and Teller get killed. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned many a time that I'm a huge Penn and Teller fan. And I see a little bit of Teller in Harpo's stuff. Teller is, uh, you know, his performance is a lot different. He's really sly and he's very smooth and he absolutely earns the respect of an audience. Yeah. Because he's the one and Penn, you know, jokes about this all the time that does all the magic. And Penn just makes loud, you know, loud noises at that. And Teller's really good at that stuff. But I was reading an interview where someone actually asked him about, you know, the Marx Brothers and if he was influenced by Harpo when he was younger. And I thought it was funny. The reason he cited Harpo not being an idol of his, not being someone who he was influenced by, was that he was too clownish. Yeah. That he found, um, you know, he found a lot of interest in him when he was being uh, violent or I think the word he used was fiendish. Mm -hmm. But the clownish stuff was always kind of a, a turnoff for him. And I see a lot of that in Harpo, whether it's the charades or... The big cigarette. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, almost prop comedy. Yeah, that the kind fencing of thing. stuff. But I think Harpo still deserves a lot of recognition. And I don't think anything, you know, Teller saying was sliding him of that. Um, it's just kind of different routines, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, you watch Harpo do these different things. The, particularly the scene in A Night in Casablanca where he's playing the harp, mm-hmm. uh, where he gets out of the elevator. Right, and, his namesake. Yeah, I've never actually seen anybody play a harp. Maybe yeah. it's always this mind-blowing when you see it. Somebody who's good at playing the harp will always look that good playing the harp. It's pretty fucking amazing, though, right? I mean, that yeah, doesn't diminish shocking. it at all. It, it really is shocking. And he's kind of playing this, this medley of different pieces, mm-hmm. But stuff that are, you know, it's woven together and it kind of has its own unique spin on the pieces. And it's done for a, a really cheap gag. Yeah. I mean, the gag is that he's impressing the, the yeah. poster. It's really just an excuse for him to show they off. They do that all the time. They do that in plenty of the Marx Brothers movies. And that's because that's what they do, that they're good at it. I mean, they right. were probably raised playing these instruments. And I ended up doing comedy as a side thing. Sure, but this isn't a stage show. So they can't get away with all right, now we're just going to play an instrument. Uh They're doing it in the format of a film. So they need some kind of reason to go up into the attic and play a harp. And so that's just, you know, that's just the excuse that the Chico has something really similar. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chico has a piano number. Right. And that's amazing. Not so much for the song, which is all right, whatever. But the song's not the amazing part for me. It's the ease in right. which he plays it exactly it's uh i mean it's a gag for him uh-huh. he's uh the thing he does with his uh with his right hand especially the way the frame is lined up yeah. and you know it's a, a single take shot uh-huh. that we're looking at for the beginning of the piece or the first half of the piece or what have you and it's just showing his hands you know at work and his right hand is making gags while his right. left hand is doing he's pointing at keys and he's kind of making a little gun gesture yep. as he nails off the note it seems so effortless to him. Yeah. It's pretty amazing when you see it. But how else would you define Chico? Because I feel like he's often the one, Groucho we know, mm-hmm. and uh, Harpo doesn't talk, so that's easy right. enough. But who the fuck is Chico then? Chico is the guy that for some reason fakes an Italian accent all the time. <laughs> so he's, it's a fake accent. Yeah, he, he fakes this this kind of... He's kind of always a businessman. He's kind of always looking to make some cash, but he's a nice guy. Right. He's always... Trying to figure out a way to reconcile wanting to make money and not wanting other people to get in trouble and get right. hurt. He's usually an accomplice 
to Harpo and sure. usually an enemy to Groucho. Yeah, That's right, usually right. how it pans out that he and Harpo will do double gags together. In this thing, in this film, for example, they do the whole thing in the uh, the nightclub, right? Where they just set up tables, mm-hmm. and Groucho's kind of off doing his own thing. But then later on, we have the the opposite thing where Chico is knocking on the door consistently, thwarting Groucho's right. plans to sleep with i don't even know if that's the intention in in this film i, I think, think he just kind idea. of wants to cuddle yeah that might be it too but grout but but chico, he wants to cuddle the mustache wants some action right exactly but chico won't give him any action and eventually he takes the action away so then we're left with groucho groucho is my favorite i mean i know he's kind of everybody's favorite but i love groucho marks he um so this is not the first time that we've actually heard I mean, I guess it's the first time we've technically seen Groucho on the show. First time we've seen him act. Mm-hmm. But we saw some stills of Groucho and heard a good, friendly Groucho conversation back when we did The Devil's Rejects. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> was good. I believe the conversation ends with, fuck Groucho. <laughs> right, But right. in this film, Groucho is in full form. He's he's more than a photograph. He plays, So he plays the manager of the hotel. Yeah, he manages this hotel the way I would manage a hotel. Yeah. I love it. He runs this thing. He's talking about changing all the numbers. He's fucking with the patrons. It would be this great performance art to Uh show up and do that. You can tell even just in playing that part, they're still thinking performance art as they're making actual fucking art, as they're making a movie. Yeah. He shows up and, and Groucho always plays a womanizer. He's holds tight to a penny. He's a jerk. He is not looking out for any, he's, he's a shark, you know, but he's also very poor. Yeah, right. And he he walks around in oversized suits and with a hunch for some reason. Yeah. <laughs> and uh and my favorite thing about Groucho Marx is that he always always one-ups everything everyone does the sure. entire at nauseum. <laughs> right. Don't mean like, "Oh yeah, he sure does a lot of it, but that makes him lovable." It's it's annoying <laughs> as hell. <laughs> That's the objective, right? Exactly, and I love it. And it's not always one-liners as I noticed in this film there was a two-liner that yeah. somehow there was snuck a, in. it was a it, one yeah. sentence two jokes. That, yeah, with the with the um sitting on her lap cuz the dog can stand twice as well as him. Right, right. I think my favorite one from the movie, and I want to get to that womanizing stuff cuz I think that's pretty interesting with the the Marx Brothers stuff and kind of that whole era of uh of film. But where he's talking about, he goes to the dinner, he asks her, what will you have? And she says, champagne. <laughs> and so he goes, you know, waiter, get this lady a cheese sandwich and bill it to her. Yeah. <laughs> it's something about that. It's just so mean. It's so cruel. It appeals to that, uh, that sense of dark humor I have. But women are strange in these movies. Yeah. Because they're very much objects. Mm-hmm. They're never, not to say they're um, not celebrated. Right. Because the whole idea of his character is, you know, you say womanizing, and I guess that's it's not in a bad way. He loves women, uh-huh. but at the same time, he's a little bit slimy about yeah. it. He's always coming onto them. He doesn't ever give them any space. He has no tact. And the women are there as props, mm-hmm. uh, much like a lot of the characters are. Not to say it's just women, but you don't find a funny woman in a Marx Brothers movie. That yeah, doesn't that's exist. That's true. The women are, the women are either... Like in this movie, the bo- both roles are filled. There's the femme fatale kind of role, mm-hmm. and that's usually the one that Groucho is trying to sure, get with. Sure. And then there's the sweet, innocent girl role who's always paired up with the hunky role that none of the Marx Brothers could ever fill. Right, so right. in every movie, they bring in a hunky dude who all he has to do is show up and just be a nice guy. Right. But could you imagine how different these movies would be if they had you know a female comedian in mm-hmm. there? especially in the later stuff where it starts to get a little more repetitive to really just differentiate it, to do yeah. something like Carol so, Burnett or something. Yeah. To do something so completely new. I mean, we see that a little bit more, you know, we've covered some Mel Brooks stuff right? and we do see that in the Mel Brooks movies. Mm-hmm. There's some great lines oh, given to the women of those films and even just their reactions. All any woman has to do in a Marx brothers movie is, you know, give a straight reaction so they're not even given a lot of room there. But I don't think that's just women. It's always women. Uh-huh. The women always have that role, and whereas the men don't always. But there are men who get that role, oh, too. Yeah. You know, And it's fun to see Groucho act his part across from mean people. Across, uh-huh. Look at the guy, the, the patron, yeah. or the attempted patron the, at the uh, hotel. The, what, he's the president of some laundry Laundry thing, right? Yeah. And Groucho, yeah. of course, takes off his shirt and throws uh-huh. it. I mean, he's, the, he's got the joke lined up every single and time. And we notice that a lot of the time, we don't know what the jokes mean. No, not it at all. It seems like he sometimes just pulls one-liners out of his ass, and you just have to go, oh, 
you got me. It reminds me of a Dennis Miller thing. Yeah. You know, just reference after reference, mm-hmm. and you're forced to, you either laugh at it or everyone thinks you're an idiot. You change the channel. Yeah. Change the channel is actually what you should do. But in this particular scene, there's a patron that comes in and he wants to check in with his wife, who Groucho apologizes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that right, that's his right. wife. Um, but he's such he's a rude guy and mm-hmm. he's really self entitled. And so for maybe the first and I don't want to say first and only because we're dealing with a Nazi here and we do have to eventually right. get to that. But the only character outside of the uh, outside of the Third Reich that is really made fun of, really deserving the you know the rude response that he gets from Groucho. He's he's just a jerk and and Groucho won't let him in because he's afraid he wants to have sex in his family establishment. Right, and he doesn't have his marriage license with him. And uh, you know. That's probably... Did things actually work that way? That's fucked up. I, I don't know anything about that. I just want to go on record as not supporting well, it. Is I'm that not, okay? I'm, I'm sure, yeah, I don't know anything about it either. I don't know. I doubt it was a legal thing. I'm guessing it was just his personal preference. He didn't want people fornicating outside of marriage. Sure, but then there's that weird thing where Chico won't let him have sex with the woman either. Well, that's because she's going to kill him. Those different, are different than the standards. marriage license. Yeah. Different than the marriage license. So let's get to these goddamn Nazis. So we were going to look at a couple differing approaches uh, to making fun of the Nazis yeah. as a reaction to World War II. Uh-huh. Because when you're in uh, a really fucked up situation, whether you're just getting into it or in this case, just kind of getting out uh, out of it, we also, I mean, we just dropped the bomb. So that's about as fucked up a thing as mm-hmm. the United States yeah. has ever, I don't know, the United States has done some fucked up things in its history. But that's up there, right? No, absolutely. And so there is a period of taste where you don't want to react to that. A period I and Gilbert Godfrey do not believe in uh-huh. something we covered during the aristocrats right. with Gilbert Godfrey's wonderful. I still love the guy to this day because of the nine 11 stuff he did at the, uh, the roast. Mm-hmm. But beyond the period of taste, once you get past that, and that's not really what we're concerned with here. There is the question of what is the reaction? What, um, what do comedians do in reaction to that? You know, after nine 11, uh, what did the daily show do? How did it start covering that? You know, how do comedians talk about tragic events? And with the Marx Brothers, this was still in a reactionary period where we were, we still needed to say, hey, fuck you, Nazis. That still needed to happen. And so to look at how they treated that, especially in contrast to when we get to the great dictator, Mm -hmm. I don't want to say they pulled their punches here, but I feel like this was a lot lighter. Yeah, it's, it's a weird look at Nazis, especially this close to the actual war going on. Right. Because the Nazis just kind of a meanie. And I right. mean, he's killing people. He's poisoning people, but you know, he's just poisoning them. It's not a big. He's deal. a jerk. And he's a jerk, and he's got a scar, and he's constantly being befuddled. And there's right, all this. Right. He's just a. He's 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 a total dork the whole time. They set up and humiliate him throughout the mm-hmm. film. He just becomes, you know, the end of every single gag. Right. And granted, he's wanted for being a Nazi and and on such and such a thing, but right, they right. never really come out and go. This guy's a Nazi. Nazism is wrong. They're like, this guy's a Nazi. Also, he's a buffoon. They make a buffoon out of him. That's exactly what they do. He falls for fucking everything in the movie. He is the mark for everything. Um, and in addition to that, you even have pieces where he starts to look like he's insane, where we start to see, I mean, we just want a bad time to befall him at this point. Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, the scene where they're in his dressing room mm-hmm. and they're moving from place to place. They're constantly unpacking. Yeah, making him think that he's going fucking crazy. And this is toward the end of the film where we're just, I mean, we just want to pick on the Nazi. Yep. I get the feeling that this is less of a reaction to World War II. This is less of where the great dictator will talk about that mm-hmm. opening up comedy for right. World War II. I think this was more... You know, we need to break the taboo of talking right. about Nazis in cinema. Right. We need to break the taboo. We need to make it so that they can just be a punching yeah. bag and everyone will be comfortable with that. Yeah, because it's certainly not that the Marx Brothers, Groucho in particular, I can't, honestly, I want to say that I know all the Marx Brothers hate Nazis. I could <laughs> say that. And then if somebody, if I was wrong, I'm sure I'd get called out on it. But what I can say for certain is is that Groucho did a Charleston on Hitler's grave. <laughs> right. So not a big fan. There's, yes, it's not, it's not kind of, well, let's not be too hard on these guys. They hate them. They fucking despise them. But, you know, it's not, that's not the place. It's not the time to right. hate and despise Nazis in, in a comedy film. Yeah, I think it becomes more a question of how do we add our own particular, you know, what are the Marx Brothers going to say about World War II? What do the Marx Brothers have to contribute to that reaction of World War II that hasn't either already been done 
or is appropriate for the time or that they're most well suited to yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. Because they have an audience. They've right. it's not they're not just starting. They've been around. Exactly. They they're in a position out, for this. Yeah, they can't come out and and be dangerous and shocking anymore. <laughs> right. That that would absolutely ruin them as performers. It might not even be it's not what their particular breed of comedy calls for. It's more of a, a chaplain kind of thing. And it's probably not the time and place for that. Mm -hmm. You know, whether that was already done a bit earlier or needed to come in a lot harder, uh, farther after that, much like when we talk about exploitation films and, you know, the werewolf women of the SS kind of thing, where we're just putting Nazi women, sexy, sure. crazy, striptease stuff in movies just to well, show Dead that... Snow did it too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was no need for them to be Nazis. Yeah, no. So we're just talking about Nazi gold. That just comes up every once in a while. But there's these phases then to dealing with grief, dealing with war, and dealing with taboo subject matter. And this was one layer on what would, you know, go so completely insane to today's today's modern day approach where you can make a Nazi joke and it's years past and everybody's completely okay with whatever fucked up reference. Mm -hmm. You know, by the time we get to the uh, the Russ Meyer stuff when we covered up, yep. I mean, then we're really yeah. trying to push people's buttons with it. Then Hitler takes it up the butt. Yeah, then it's just a lone man using uh nazis to push people's buttons mm -hmm. and he offends a couple people and right. then everyone else uses that as a precedent to say that right. was the, the worst fucking thing that ever came out so that's you know that's way later in 60s mm -hmm. 70s when we're dealing with that whereas the marx brothers is still the popularization of yeah using the nazis as a yeah. punching bag but they're certainly not the first comedians to make fun of nazis sure. if ever there were a way <laughs> to be too soon on making fun of hitler and world war ii if you could pick a year yeah, six right. year span of world war ii sure. in on planet earth right what year would you say would definitely be okay to start making fun of hitler oh 1940 okay <laughs> well the funny thing about the chaplain stuff um, I guess we're just going to start talking about The Great Dictator, right? Yeah. Because we have to. Mm -hmm. uh, the funny thing about Chaplin is the fucking mustache, okay? Yeah. So the mustache might have been what led Chaplin to do this right. movie. Uh, I've seen Chaplin talk a little bit about how he was really personally kind of torn up. He had personal demons in regards to the fact he looked like Hitler yeah. and they had a similar birthday mm -hmm. and, you know, to think about the... Um, what he considered kind of his side of what was a coin. Right. So Chaplin has a history of being a comedian and being laughed at. Mm -hmm. And then fucking Hitler comes out and copies his shit with right. this stupid mustache. And it turns out that Chaplin had been making fun of Hitler before Hitler was even in power. Take that Hitler. Right. And the same thing. I don't, I mean, I don't know. We couldn't, unfortunately we couldn't do a triple feature today because there's also a three stooges film where Mo is Hitler <laughs> oh, because they have the same haircut. Yeah, sure. Why not? But you know, I'm guessing it's the same thing. If, if you're thrust into a situation where you look like Hitler, you just have to, there's, you have to be Hitler now. People are waiting for him to do it. So this is a, it's a film from 1940. It's written, produced, starring, directed, and has some music by Charlie Chaplin. And while he didn't exclusively do 100% of all, what, I guess, five of those things, mm -hmm. um, he certainly he did 200% of the acting. Yeah, of the right. starring role. Yeah, and so he has, you know, dual roles in it. I mean, he's doing a lot of work here. Chaplin was one of the people that really held out the longest I guess he was the man. He was the guy. That, yeah, I he mean, was I'm the sure last there were one. some lesser actors that nobody would nobody know cares nowadays, about. Right. but he was the guy. So, of course, we're referring to talkies, mm -hmm. right? We're referring to when movies added sound. And we talked a little bit about that way back when we did Fritz Lang's M, uh -huh. because it was one of the first, um, I was going to say mainstream, but I don't even know if that word existed yeah. back then for what we're talking about. Widely known movies, yeah. I guess, that had some kind of component to sound to it. And we, um, you know, when we watched that, we noted that there was a lot of periods where it was still a silent film, much the same with The Great Dictator, yeah. even in Chaplin's performance. He's doing a lot of these bits that were probably written, you know, years before The Great Dictator. Stuff like the shaving routine or the <laughs> the fucking globe balloon thing yeah. that we'll get to. Or the bomb, when the bomb is spinning. Yeah, right, right. That are, you know, that are little silent performances, almost little vignettes in mm -hmm. their own right that are thrown into this larger, that really, what is an epic movie? Yeah. A movie that starts with World War I and continues um, before the, you know, the Americans joined World War II. So what's Chaplin's deal for not wanting to be in a talkie? Why do he hold out so everybody else is doing it 
And he's thinking, oh, this talky thing, it's a phase, it'll pass. His, yeah, his big problem was that he was afraid that talking would ruin the tramp. The character, his big yeah, character right. that, I mean, the barber is basically the tramp. When the barber gets hit on the head with the pan, okay. that's when he's the tramp. Right, right. But he was afraid. So self preservation. Yeah, at that he point. was afraid that that would ruin the character of the tramp. And that he didn't have the right voice for what he wanted to do. It is weird hearing his voice, though, isn't it? It's absolutely bizarre hearing his voice. But when he gets fired up, especially, uh, you know, not the first time he's Hitler or the character that resembles Hitler. We know it's not. Those same fucking people who email us about 28 weeks later not having zombies, they're going to be the ones who email us about Hitler not being in this film, right? Fuck those people. I didn't even bother remembering the character's name. It's just going to be Hitler, all right? Everybody knows who I'm talking about. The first time you see him as Hitler... And he's talking about sauerkraut all the time. And uh-huh. it's, uh, it's a funny, albeit a little long, but a uh, funny part of the movie. The second time we see him kind of in that same position, it's just an interjection yeah. when we're dealing with the ghetto and when we're dealing with uh, the barber and all of the Jews, we just see an interjection of him yelling, yeah. uh, yelling into these microphones, yelling out to the crowd. Right. And we see him get pretty fired up toward uh-huh. the end, too. And his voice is a lot different. He's got a lot more of, I mean, it's obvious authority. It's command. But there's some fire there that you don't see when he's on the complete opposite side. Mm -hmm. I think he's trying to show a large spectrum. He's trying to show he can do some things with his voice. Mm -hmm. So he creates his first talkie and uh, one that was really well known. One of his most well-known films, although... People remember him for being a silent actor. They don't remember him for these roles. Yeah, I think I think what's what's really bizarre for people is that a lot of people know that Charlie Chaplin was in The Great Dictator. Mm-hmm. They don't know that there was talking in right. The Great Dictator. Right, right. Which is how he probably would have wanted it. He mm-hmm. wants the recognition for the thing he put together. He would always have remembered himself as a, a silent era actor. The thing that surprised me even more so than his voice was the fucking production values of yeah. this movie, specifically in the beginning. When everything's giant and blowing up. Oh, my God. So we have this um, this war movie that we just mm-hmm. turned on here, right? And it starts on a really wide shot, and there's explosions going off, and there's a lot of detail to what is a pretty barren set. Yeah. I mean, for just looking at World War One trenches... They're pretty mapped out. Yep. I expected this to be a movie we had to play along with a little mm-hmm. bit. Some we stock to... footage. Yeah. Most of the time he's just in a building. Right, and it's goofy. I expected that we'd have to use our imaginations a bit on this one. But you see the trenches. You see every fucking sandbag, and they're all dug out, and they have the barbed wire on them, and more so the explosions. Mm-hmm. The fa- I mean, explosions can't be that expensive, but they're going off in beautiful synchronicity, it seems like a more serious version of the kind of choreography we would later see when he's, you know, doing a ballerina scene mm-hmm. or um, a kind of mime scene, even with the bomb or right. with uh, with a food fight. Later. Yeah. So we we kind of move away from World War One really quick, but not without this wonderful plane scene. Yeah. That yeah. It, it ends up being very integral to the plot of the film because sure. that's where the barber meets schultz and then ends up that ends up being like a huge plot point as yeah, to yeah. why the nazis don't bug the jews on this particular block exactly and this that and the other thing but it's a hilarious scene where essentially he abandons his post defending the line right and this was after the giant gun right i don't know wars very well because i'm a fucking pacifist but whatever that giant magnificent beautiful terrifying awful human destroying device is it is, it's gigantic yeah. and they somehow make it comical mm-hmm. and, uh, and I love that thing. It's huge and it's scary and I'm surprised it was in the, it takes up yeah. the whole fucking frame Yeah, and yeah, so he goes on this plane and that whole section of the movie, I mean, it's just packed with gags yeah. and it's incredibly enjoyable, but then they crash. Yeah. That's and a little fucked a up, isn't it? Very violent crash. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that to be as messed up as it was. Yeah. It's a really violent crash. And they land and find out, in my head, they find out that because he abandoned his post, they lost the war. Right, right. Because That's the, what happened. the other army moved in because there was nobody defending that section of the entire country. And boop, we lost the war. Thanks for flying upside down the whole time. You played StarCraft. That's all it takes. Dude, once they take out your bunker, it's all shit from there. But when we eventually get the Hitler stuff, when we, um, we have you know, the, the setup of what is this movie's version of Downfall, showing us the inner workings Mm -hmm. of the Third Reich. And the 
the things I love the most about this, I mean, their kind of set design is great and this huge desk he has and he can't fucking get a pen working yeah. ever. And for some reason, that's hilarious. Two to second me. paintings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The two second, the idea that he's manipulated all this art, that there's still the thinker, but he also has his hand in salute. Mm-hmm. But what I really love is bringing him new technology. Yeah. It almost feels like a Bond film. They're constantly, you know, they bring him a bulletproof uniform and he shoots the guy and, you know, we're expecting some kind of gag with this. He shoots him in a part the uniform doesn't cover or whatever, but he shoots the guy and the guy just dies. And oh, that didn't work. Fuck you guys. Get yep. back to work. Or then you have the parachute hat. The parachute hat doesn't even make any fucking sense, mm-hmm. but it's just this guy in a stupid hat. And anytime your visual joke can involve a stupid hat, I mean, you should probably go for that, right? Yeah, it becomes 10 times funnier. The stupid hats need to be, cinema needs to be full of stupid hats. And so the guy jumps out the window. There isn't a splat, although they could have exploited their newfound sound Mm -hmm. uh, to do that. And he looks up and realizes the failure. There's even, you know, a scene where um, the general comes in and is talking to him about the new poison. Right. Hey, we've got this new poison. It's going to kill everybody. This guy is really excited. He's just created this new piece of technology. And, you know, it's a little fucked up because it makes you think about you know, we're in an era now, we're watching this before the bomb. Mm-hmm. This is the 1940s. And people may be aware that there's some fucked up technology that's being worked on, but it's really before a lot of the Manhattan Project stuff, and obviously far before we dropped the bomb. And so, you know, we're creating these ways to kill people, which are fucked up. However, in your day-to-day, nine-to-five science grind, you're, uh, you know, you're thinking about how to create this chemical combination. You're trying to solve a puzzle. And when you invent a piece of technology, you're really excited about it. So I like that they're showing this because I don't know if the reaction really in the labs was that much different from yeah. this guy's reaction. Right. I They probably tried not to think about it. They had to put that out of their mind. Or maybe they didn't because they were fighting for what they thought was a good cause. Right. So they're thinking, all right, we've got this thing. It's going to kill all the Jews. Hooray. We've mixed the perfect concoction. You know, they have some kind of pride in it. And it's moments like that where they force us to consider the pride of creating a weapon to decimate, you know, millions of people. That's pretty fucked up right there. That's something that you climb a curtain over. Okay, what the fuck happened there? I don't know. For some reason, Hitler climbs a curtain. He gets told he's going to be a god. He gets giddy, prances over to the side of the room, climbs a curtain, and it doesn't get better from there it just i mean it does get better it does actually it get doesn't better make any more saying, sense for a little while yeah i don't we I, get we get what is really akin to uh one of the from the previous films one of the like show off look i can play the harp scenes right right where it's just it's kind of fantasia it's this piece kind of makes me think of hitler dancing with a balloon glow sure sure at this point it starts to border on you know, with the Mel Brooks stuff, we talked about the producers um, from the producers, of course, Hitler in springtime, which was always a hilarious idea to me. One of the things I really love about the producers, but seeing Hitler prance around and seeing Hitler throw around a balloon globe, which is pretty funny on mm-hmm. its own. Um, a lot of the things Hitler does, I mean, the the banana gag is yeah. amazing. I don't know why he just unpeels a banana and then rips it out and then throws them both away. Yeah. You know, these little strange, some of them are flamboyant. Some of them are just nonsensical. When he gets this balloon globe back over to his desk Mm -hmm. and starts kind of posing on the desk and eventually hits it with his butt and it comes back down. And the the first reaction, we actually showed this to somebody Mm -hmm. uh, immediately after seeing the movie. You and I saw it and kind of looked at each other. Did that just happen? And um, and the same reaction happened um, when we showed it to somebody. You know, it goes up for the first time. Did that just happen? And then they do it again because they know everybody is turning to each other and going, did the movie really just have him bounce that in the air with his ass? Mm -hmm. And so he has to do it one more time just so everyone can say, oh, yeah, he did just bounce that in the air with his ass. That's fine. Hitler is not the only character in the film that's suspiciously paralleled. Right, you know, right. within the story. They also do uh, Herring, who is Goring, and Garbage, who is Goebbels. Right. And then they do Mussolini, except it's what, ben, Benzino Apolloni? Napoloni, I Napoloni. think. I think there's some combination of uh, Napoleon in there, Yeah, too. that's probably what it is. Or maybe he just doesn't nap with anybody. This is where we start to get a lot of the uh, mocking the dictator time. We've been spending a lot of time with the Jews before this. Mm-hmm. and Hanging out with the Jews. I eating think... Some- some coin cake coin pudding actually Sorry. we got to set up the resistance you know 
So Chaplin still wants to play a sympathetic character, but eventually realizes people are going to the great dictator to see him make fun of Hitler. Mm -hmm. And it's something that, you know, at the time, a lot of people gave him shit for. Uh, Maybe were scared for him or didn't think it was the appropriate time for it. But he said, you know what? It has to be okay to mock Hitler. I mean, that's almost verbatim his Mm -hmm. words. It has to be okay to mock Hitler. And so it's something he wanted to do. And I love seeing him next to, you know, another head of state in these positions where they're trying to get him to be higher up than this guy, literally, physically higher up than this guy for photo ops. And they're just showing this is the Marx Brothers part. This is the part where we see what a buffoon Hitler is. Uh, This is kind of the hitting the Gestapo on the head with frying pans thing Mm -hmm. that we got earlier. But now we're just in full force making fun of Hitler. Up until Hitler gets apprehended, I guess, and then he they gets, switch yeah, roles. Yeah, he gets arrested for floating in a tiny boat. There is an inevitable role switch that yeah. has to happen, right? And it happens so close to the end. So going into this film, I had read really just one thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't recall whether it was that the speech at the end was too long or that it was too overbearing. But the whole time I'm watching the film going, okay, the speech has got to be coming up. I'm looking at my imaginary watch because I actually own a cell phone. Sure. And... I told you before, I'm an Atlas Shrugged guy. I'm waiting for a 45-minute Who is John Galt speech. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking it's going to be insanely long. The second half of the movie, right? That's going to be the speech. And the clock is ticking down until there's, what, maybe five minutes left? Yeah, maybe And that's when it happens. Yeah. It's after the scenes where uh, the barber is now masquerading as Hitler. And I love that, too, that he flinches. Uh Every time he walks by and they all salute or they raise their guns or whatever, he flips the fuck out. It just shows how unnatural and awful all of this organization and military well, and, and how the scared the jews and, were yeah right well clearly that too clearly that too but i don't think you can get a more you know talking about myself as a pacifist mm-hmm. i don't know that i could see something that gives me more joy than just seeing a natural human reaction to a bunch of people in uniform yeah. fucking doing something in unison it's terrifying does not need to happen so i guess we should talk about this speech a little bit yeah But I don't think the speech is nearly as controversial. I didn't think it was necessarily too long. No, I didn't think... I I definitely... I felt like it was overblown. I I didn't think it was a big part of the... Oh, you felt like the reaction was overblown. Yeah, I felt like everybody's reaction was of the speech. I thought it was fine. It was not too long. Yeah, I got the feeling that a little bit of it, you know, as I said earlier, was almost him showing off. Mm -hmm. If he's going to come into the talkies, he wants to come in in a big way. Right. How do you feel about the content of the speech then? I, you know, I can probably agree with a lot of it. A lot of it is don't let Nazis hurt people. Sure, right. It's pretty uh, safe. I'm down with don't let Nazis hurt people. I'm I'm down with don't just do stuff because people are telling you to. I'm okay with people need to be nice to each other. Well, but, yeah, he kind of opens with uh, we all want to help each other. Human beings are like that. I mean, right. it's hard to disagree with that. Yeah. All the, all the really simple fodder, if I put this in a speech, people will agree with me stuff. I mean, obviously, I agree with. There's a lot of machinery is bad for you that i don't dig. yeah yeah a little bit of that luddite stuff yeah i think he might be using machinery as a metaphor for the uh well i want to say he's using it as a metaphor for that thing i said i don't like the uniformity of soldiers yeah the, but uh, i think he's trying to say think for yourself but yeah, he's also kind of making a I call think he's for war. also saying don't make hat parachutes yeah <laughs> you think that's what that is yeah can you elaborate on that a little for me well i think it's just a reference to earlier in the film where they start making you mentioned it where they make all these weapons right and i think it's just a reference to you know the more things we make the more things sure. can go wrong sure it could be that too i mean he's he he acknowledges the plane and the radio have brought people closer together but who's being helped by a nuclear bomb without even knowing the bomb that right. he was kind of predicting as he's talking about this technology mm-hmm as he's making fun of the new poisons. This is the moment where I'm thinking, this is the world before the bomb. How weird, how bizarre and surreal does that make this speech? I mean, I'm right there with you on a lot of that stuff I can get behind. The, uh, you know, the stuff about helping each other and not wanting to live by each other's misery, but instead by each other's habit. That's all good. Mm -hmm. Trying to understand the metaphor of the machine and, you know, to talk about people being cold and heartless as machines, to talk about that kind of cynicism. And then also to say, soldiers, don't give yourself to brutes. Um, But then kind of saying, instead of, you know, instead of fighting for slavery, why don't we fight for liberty? It's also still including fighting. Yeah. So I don't think he's making a call against war. I also don't know if it's necessarily against technology, although he does make an interesting, he picks an interesting point to then say, hey, all this technology 
uh, might be bad. There's all this this greed uh, that men have, all the cynicism men have. And also, look how this technology has brought us closer together. That's caused conflict. Mm-hmm. Rather than saying the technology's brought us closer together, that's all well and good, but. You right. know what I mean? Yep. But while it's interesting to to kind of think about a lot of these ideas, it's sort of a moot point yep. at this time, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, we're well beyond World War II. Uh-huh. Who knows what he was saying there? It's interesting to read into, mm-hmm. but I fear kind of doing the Nostradamus thing yeah. to say what was what was Chaplin predicting. Yeah. There's already enough pseudoscience involving Chaplin, DVD extras, and cell phones. Yeah, We don't need to start reading into his speech too much. But I think everybody knows our ideas on the show, and we yeah. heard Chaplin's ideas, and you can kind of make that into... That's the, the beauty of prose, right? Yeah. Is you can pretty much morph that into whatever the fuck you want it to mean. Yeah, I would definitely say that the lasting impression of this film is Hitler dancing with the globe, and not a poor barber talking about the troubles of war. And Charlie Chaplin going, fuck all you guys, I can do a talkie. That's my lasting yeah. impression. That's what I'll always remember from that speech. That's not going to change over time. Oh, hi, Hitler. That show went really well. Yeah, if you want to echo that in an email, that's doublefutureshow at gmail.com. Or uh, leave some feedback on iTunes regarding uh, the show. You want us to cover more of this stuff. I think our last iTunes review is from June. <laughs> June of 2008, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go on iTunes and leave a review because the more reviews we get, the more we, I don't know, show up in the charts or I don't know how the fucking iTunes algorithm Billboard works. Billboard Top 40. Doublefeatureshow.com is the website. You can find an old backlog of all the shit we talked about on there. And you can go to donate.doublefeatureshow.com, give us some money. And then you could potentially pick out what we do for the end of the year. So we're going to email some people who donate and we're going to say, hey, what movies do you want us to do? And we're going to pick some of those movies, two of them, I Mm -hmm. guess, and put them back to back at the end of the year. Sounds like a really good idea. And if you happen to subscribe on there, you're also going to be able to email us a little vocal clip thing. We're going to stick that in the intro on that show. And that's going to be awesome. It's going to be so bad. This is the beauty of creating your own open source intro. You're Uh uh, I don't want to say public domain. What was it? Creative Commons. That's, That's the, the, the term I was looking for. Mm. Creative Commons intro. I guess even if we didn't make it Creative Commons, I could, still could have edited it. This just means people can be doing this at home themselves. Yeah. Let's not give them ideas. Anyways, we have two movies we're doing next time. Yeah. So this is another interesting one. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a lot of weird shit going on this show. There's a lot of weird what shit. What weird shit are we doing on the show next we're time? We're going to do The Exorcism of Emily Rose and The Fourth Kind, which deals with uh, both the possession from the devil and the possibility of alien life forms invading our planet. I got all my humanism stuff out in Uh the Chaplin movie. Uh Um, I probably need to mention that uh, there is no God because that just needs to happen every once in a while. Fourth kind disagrees. It does. It does disagree. Oddly, it's it's the exorcism of Emily Rose that doesn't necessarily disagree with that. We'll talk about both of those next time. I just wanted to mention that while we're going to cover both of these movies, uh, we're not really going to talk about the bullshit pseudoscience in them, which clearly doesn't exist and mm-hmm. we don't endorse as uh, people are pretty skeptically minded ourselves. That's right. So don't let that get in your way of, you know, watching the films and the stuff that we need to talk about that's beyond that in the films. It's going to be really good. Watch more fucking film. All right. Bye.